This week's work is on projectile motion. This is essentially the equations of motion working in two separate dimensions, the vertical case and the horizontal. Mathematically, any time you have two vectors that are at 90 degrees to each other, they're said to be independent. That means they don't influence each other. And we're going to use that assumption here. We're also going to presume that air resistance is effectively zero. That works just fine if you have a reasonably dense object that you're throwing and you're not going at particularly high speeds. Finally, the third assumption is that the ground is effectively flat. I'm not saying the whole planet's flat, I'm just saying that our range here is small enough that you don't have to account for the curvature of the Earth. There are a few demonstrations to confirm the previous claims first though. Um, this little wooden block is something that I would show you in class, but feel free to have a look at the video clip. It involves a spring, and you can pull this little lever back, and it locks in place. There are a pair of steel balls. One of them sits just on this side, and the other over here. When you push the button, it goes ping, and both balls are dropped at the same time. But the one that was sitting on top of the metal bracket near the spring simply falls. The one at the other side, though, gets shot forward. That allows you to compare the motion of two balls released from the same height, at the same position, but with one of them being shoved forwards. The idea we're trying to show is that the vertical motion and the horizontal motion are completely separate from each other. Another demonstration which does the same thing involves a long Pascal track and a little launcher that sits on top of the car. The launcher is calibrated such that the ball inside, when you press it down and let it go, it shoots up and it'll wiggle a bit little but then fall back into the basket. It's not perfect but you're aiming to get it to land exactly on top of the launcher. What you then do is start the car at one side, give a big old shove and there's a little light gate that's triggered by a small sort of mask or a piece of metal that launches the ball while the cart is still moving. This allows you to see that the ball shooting out of the cart still lands exactly back in the basket, even though it's moving. Um, most interestingly, I recently came across this video here. This is a group of rather adventurous folks getting pulled along by a tractor on top of a trampoline. The two people that are standing here are basically priming the elastic, so this person bounces up and down. Some people would assume that if you're jumping up and down on top of a trampoline that's moving, you're going to hit the ground, because by the time you land, the trampoline will have moved. Now it is correct that when you land, the trampoline will have moved from where you left it, but you're also going to be moving along side to side as well. And that's the interesting part. I encourage you to have a look at these videos. Um, this video clip here goes into a bit more detail. This is from the guy that does flipping physics. And he shows video clips of vertical motion, of sideways motion, and two-dimensional motion at the same time. And this allows you to see that the up and down direction and the side-to-side -side direction are completely separate from each other. If you roll side to side and throw up and down at the same time, you end up with the pattern that you see here. Slow motion, here we go. <laughs> All right. Same time, gang? Yeah. Gravity doesn't take a holiday on an object just because it's moving.
let's combine them all. Again, notice how the x direction has a constant velocity and the y direction has a uniform downward acceleration. To show you how this works when we do the calculations, here are three of the relatively simple worked examples we can start with. For projectiles, it is two-dimensional. You have your vertical motion and your horizontal motion, and they happen at the same time. The handy trick is you can completely separate all the other variables. The vertical speed and the horizontal speed are completely separate from each other. Same, as, same with the acceleration. The only variable the two motions share is the time. How I like to think of it is the vertical motion buys you time in the air and the horizontal motion makes use of that to travel. But that's a bit of a simplification. Normally in these examples the first thing you would do was take the starting vector and split the horizontal and vertical speed in order to work out those pieces. But these examples come with that already done. In the first one, we have a plane. We're told it is traveling horizontally at 350 meters per second at a height of 300 meters. You might ask, why have I drawn a diagram in my work example? Well, I always draw diagrams, and you should too. Diagrams are your friend. They will make your life so much easier, and they're just always a good idea. If you are going to draw one, though, draw it a decent size. Roughly the size of your hand is good. Small diagrams are not worth bothering with. So we're interested in this question on how long it's going to take, in terms of time, for the box the plane is carrying to hit the ground when we let it go. Also, for part B, we're asked how far away is it going to travel from where it was released. A little side note here, if you are delivering aid packages or bombs at wartime, when a plane releases its payload, the item that's dropped does not land directly underneath the plane. It actually carries forward a little bit and lands over here. This has all sorts of interesting effects when it comes to positioning defense systems and things like that. It's why fighter jets try and go as fast as possible. But anyway, back to our example. It's really a two-dimensional SUVAT problem, so we're going to do SUVAT twice. In the vertical case, we have the full thing. And for the horizontal, well, we don't. It's actually a bit simpler. There's never an acceleration in the horizontal case. And the starting speed and final speed will always stay the same because we're ignoring any air resistance. I should say here, if you haven't already had a look at the SUVAT file, you need to do that first. I'm not going to go through it all here. So in our case here for the vertical, we know that we're going to fall 300 meters. So I'm going to say that's minus 300. Minus means downward. We're told the, the box is dropped, not thrown. So dropped means the starting speed is zero. We're also not interested in the final speed. No one cares. And for our acceleration, it's minus 9.8. Because it's always 9.8. And we've said minus means downward. We're trying to find the time. So we have a look at our equation list. And we find which of the five SUVAT questions uh, equations we want to use. And it turns out this one is the winner today. We substitute in all of our numbers and we end up with a sum that results in the time being equal to 7.82 seconds. Now this time corresponds to two different bits of motion. That is the time it took the box to fall, but it's also the time the box had to travel sideways. That's the time for this overall two-dimensional motion which is quite handy. So on the one hand, we've answered how long did the box take to fall, that's the answer for A, but also in part B, when we're asked to figure out how far it went, well, we know the time it had to do that. And we know from the starting question, when we had the speed, how fast it was moving in that direction. So part B is basically distance equals speed times time. We put in our two numbers and finish off the calculation. For the final part, a more thinking question, it says, where is the plane when the box hits the ground? Well, you see, the plane, when it let go of the box, was traveling this way, horizontally, at 350 meters per second, the same sideways speed as the box. 
So both of them are going to travel sideways at the same speed, which means, well, the box falls while it's doing that, but it doesn't really matter, it lands here, and the plane, it will have traveled the same horizontal distance. So the answer would be, the plane is directly over the box, 300 meters up. The second example might seem completely different. We're shooting a cannon ball off of a cliff, or throwing something. But it's actually the same physics. We start off at a certain height, we have our horizontal speed, in this case it's 12, and the, the ball will follow a parabolic path. In this question, we're told the distance to the cliff, uh, from the cliff to where the ball hits the water is 60 meters, but we're not told the height. What we need to do here is first calculate the time of flight. Then we're asked to figure out how high the cliff must have been. We don't have much information, but if we construct our SUVAC questions in both horizontal and vertical, we can figure out what it is we do know. Well, horizontally, the ball will travel 60 meters. And the starting speed and the final speed are the same, that's 12. We know there's no acceleration, and what we're trying to find is the time. Well, we can use this distance equals speed times time equation, because we have distance, we have speed, we want time, and that allows us to work it out. It's worth noting, though, before we proceeded, that I wrote down the other in vertical information stuff. We know that S is going to be known as the height. We know that the starting vertical speed is zero. We know we're not interested in the final vertical speed. We know the acceleration is going to be downwards at 9.8. And the time, well, we don't know it, but it's going to be found from the horizontal stuff and be used later on. Completing the answer, well, in blue here, we use the horizontal information to work out the time. Then, to answer part B, we take that time and we insert it into this other equation, which is based on the vertical information. All these little Y subscripts just indicate it's vertical. We can solve this question and we end up with an answer of minus 122.5 meters. Now, if you're asked the question, how tall is that cliff, and you end up saying it's minus 122.5, people might look at you a bit strangely. You see, this minus sign indicates a direction. So from here down to there, that is minus 122.5 according to our sign convention. But that's not how people talk to each other. So it's not how you should finish your answer either. So here I've said the cliff is therefore 122.5 meters high. Um, small side note, we should probably round this to three significant figures to match the data we had to begin with. The third example is quite similar. Here, again, we're starting up at a certain height. We have a starting speed that's horizontal, 15 this time, and we're just given the range that it will travel. It's 45 meters. What, we are, what we're asked to work out is the time it takes to hit the ground, the distance along here, so I guess I shouldn't have given you that information, and the velocity when it strikes the ground. So the first two parts are the same as last time, so I won't talk them through too much, but we have speed equals distance over time, we can solve that, and for the vertical case, we have the same equation as before. To work out the speed when we hit the ground or the water, whatever it is, that involves using a different equation. And actually this one's a bit trickier, because we have a horizontal speed and we have a vertical speed. And what we have to do to finish this question is actually stick them back together. This involves a bit of vector work, and you might need to revise that before continuing. How the working goes is that in the horizontal direction, the speed is 15. Well, it was 15 at the start, 15 at the end, 15 in the middle. The speed in the horizontal direction doesn't change. It's always 15. So that bit's easy. In the vertical direction, though, it's a bit trickier, and we have to do a full-on SUVAT just to work that piece out. We know the acceleration down the way is minus 9.8. We know the time we have for the journey is still 3 seconds. And we know from part B, the distance that we've dropped is 44.1. I guess we also know the initial speed is 0. This allows us to choose several of the SUVAT equations to work with. 
I've chosen this one here, V equals U plus AT. Um, this is a nice choice actually because it means I'm not having to deal with this slightly more complex number. Um, I'm sticking with the relatively simple ones. So V equals U plus AT, that basically is minus 9.8 times 3 and we get 29.4 down the way. That's what minus means. You should note if you just ignore these minus signs, you will be penalized by your markers in the exam. You have to deal with it properly. So we have a horizontal motion and a vertical motion, two speeds. And what we're asked for was the overall velocity. Should be noted, they won't always specify overall. If they just say the velocity, it's implied that you have to work out the overall. So here what we have are our two vectors at 90 degrees and we're going to combine them together using the rules from National 5. We add the vectors tip to tail and we work out the overall resultant. That has a size and a direction. Please note the use of another diagram, nice and big, makes everything better. So Pythagoras says this one squared plus that one squared will be the square of the hypotenuse. And that's what this line says here. We put the numbers in, we add it all up in our calculator, and it turns out that v squared equals this number. So v is the square root of that number, which is essentially 33 meters per second. Many pupils lose marks here because they stop at this point. They feel done, so they are done. But in fact, we have to also find this angle. So given that I already know two sides, the opposite and the adjacent of this angle, I'm going to use the tan function to figure out what that angle must be. Tan of the angle would be a certain ratio. Here it's 29.4 over 15. And that can simplify to a decimal on your calculator. You then say, well, I don't want tan theta, I just want theta. So what you do is the opposite of the tan function for both sides. That function is shown like this, tan to the minus 1, and it's called arctan. Arctan of tan cancels out, and on this side you have arctan of whatever you had before. Type that into your calculator, you'll find it's about 63 degrees. Your answer still isn't complete if you leave it there, though. You have to be quite specific. So you end it with a sentence. Here I'm saying the final velocity is, is 33, it should be, at an angle of 63 degrees below the horizontal line. There are other options you could have chose, but you definitely shouldn't try a bearing. Bearings are defined from north. They don't make sense in a vertical sort of direction. In this question, it's a bit simpler, and it might seem even trickier because you don't really know what you're dealing with. But we're told the stunt driver is going to try and jump over a canal. It's 10 meters wide, and the site he starts on, or she starts on, is 2 meters higher than the landing zone. We have to work out the minimum speed required to make that jump. And then we have to describe any assumptions that we're making. Well, what we do know is that we're going to try and travel 10 meters. And that requires a certain horizontal speed. And in the vertical case, we only have two meters to fall. And we know that we're going to start accelerating downwards as soon as we leave the bank. So the idea is based on that information and a starting vertical speed of zero, we want to work out how long we have to fall down, how long we can be falling and still land safely at this height. Well, we can do that some, and we can work out that the time is about 0.64 seconds. What we then need to do is take that time and put it into the horizontal direction. So if we know we're going to be able to travel for 0.64 seconds, no matter what, no matter how fast you go, it's not going to affect the vertical. 0.64 seconds, you're going to be down at this level. If you move quickly, well, you'll land over here somewhere and you'll be fine. If you go slowly, well, 0.64 seconds later, you're still going to have fallen the two meters, but you might have fallen in the canal. And probably worst of all is if you hit the edge just here. So using distance equals speed times time, really, we can work out the minimum speed required for that. <clears throat> um, in terms of the assumptions, well, again, the usual assumptions apply. We're ignoring air resistance. Um, we're going to talk about 
the car doesn't need any leftover speed when it gets there. We're not that worried about landing safely. We're not worried about a whole bunch of other things. You know, it could be that are we measuring from the front of the car, the back of the car? Those are slightly trickier issues. It might be that when the truck leaves the ground, it starts turning. It might land sort of head first if you go a bit, if you go at this actual speed. Maybe you need to go faster so that that doesn't happen too much. So there are many things we're ignoring because they're complicated, as long as you're honest about what you're doing. These problems are similar to the previous ones. Give them a try as they'll be part of your homework. We now get into the more complex type. So if you start by shooting something up the way, the whole story gets slightly more difficult. You can almost argue that it's in two halves. The first half of the motion is when something moves up to the peak, and then the second half is the same as what we've just done. So here our question says, a football is kicked up at an angle of 70 degrees above the horizon at 15 meters per second. First of all, calculate the horizontal and vertical components of the speed. That's vector decomposition, we split it up. Then figure out how high it's going to go, figure out how long it's going to take before it lands, and figure out the range it travelled while it was doing all that. That's quite a lot. Well, my working looks something like this. We start with a diagram, we draw the path. We know it's going to start off up the way, and then it's going to curve into this projectile motion path. We mark some key points. At the very peak, we're going to say that's a certain height. And we know at the very top, the vertical speed was, will actually be zero. It's not moving up, it's not moving down, it's in the middle, it's just at zero. And finally, we know the range, or rather we can label the range. The other term I've abbreviated here is called time of flight. That's what we're after. And this is essentially my short list of what I want. For the first part, we're going to use the sine function and cosine function to split my starting vector of 50 meters per second at 70 degrees up the way into the two individual pieces, horizontal motion and vertical. If you need to revise trigonometry, I suggest you do so, but I'm not going to talk you through it here. For the second part, well, we have some horizontal information and some vertical information. But what we need to do is constrain our problem a little bit. You see, if we only have this height as a certain height and the starting vertical speed and the acceleration, that would only be three. We need a fourth one. So if we say to our equation, I'm going to choose this point here. I know something about that point. That's handy. So I'm going to say what I'm going to talk about in my sum is the height you're going to travel or the displacement you're going to travel from here up to there. And I want to work out what the time is from that information. So that's what we're doing here. We're going to say all of this information is true. And first thing, find the time of flight. Well, I know V, I know U, and I know A. The last one I can find is T. Putting all the numbers in place, V is 0, U is 14.1, acceleration is still minus 9.8. You end up with only one unknown variable at a time. And you can do the algebra, work out the sum, add on the unit. Now this is the time, 1.44 seconds, is the time it took to get to the top. But what we were asked for was the time of the whole flight, the whole journey. And the interesting thing is if there's no air resistance and you start off and end at the same height, this whole journey is symmetric. So to work out the time it took to go up, that was 1.44. You could redo the whole sum in reverse, but no need to work out the total journey. You just double the time. So the time of flight for the whole thing was 2.88 seconds. To work out how high that height was, we need an equation with an S term inside it. This one here, V squared is U squared plus 2AS, does the job nicely. We put in V is still 0, U is still 14.1, G was still 9.8. And we can solve it. It turns out this is about 10.1 meters. So we worked out how long we flew for, we worked out the height we got to. The final thing was the range. And sometimes people get a bit trapped. You see all this red stuff, this was all working in the vertical case. 
But if you want to figure out how far you've traveled sideways, that's a horizontal thing. You're not going to use the vertical information there. The only bit that's useful is the time. You see, the time for the journey is the same for both the vertical and the horizontal. So that gets added in to our horizontal list. We know the starting speed. It was 5.13 in the horizontal of the case. And we know the time. So now we can do distance is speed times time. And that ends up being 14.8. This is quite a tricky set of calculations. It's quite hard to follow all the different parts. I'd love to say it's as complicated as it gets, but there are some really tricky projectile questions out there, and you do need to be on the top of your game for them. They typically will appear in most, if not all, physics exams. A far more simpler looking one might look something like this. I'm just told you have something and it's going to go at 20 meters per second, shot up at an angle of 45 degrees, and then you're asked, well, where did it go? Where did it land? How high did it go? That sort of stuff. From the starting vector, you can work out the entire story of what happens next. So it might look something like this. Um, first step, just like before, we need to take our starting vector and split it into the two pieces. This means we have a starting horizontal speed of 14.5 and a starting vertical speed of also 14.14. If you launch at 45 degrees, you split your motion half vertical, half horizontal, and that effect is actually why you travel the furthest. Then with the vertical information, you can work out the time it took to get to the peak again. Same as the last question. It's 1.44 as well. And then you can double it to get the time of flight. If you're interested in the horizontal information, how far we've traveled sideways, well, again, you take the time from the bit you already know, add that to your horizontal set, combine it with the starting speed, and you can work out your answer is 40.8. A similar example is shown here. Here we have an archer shooting at a speed of 70, at an angle of 20 degrees to the horizon, and we're asked a similar set of things. You might have spotted the pattern here. There are only so many things you can be asked, and you're pretty much always going to be following the same procedure. Split the vector into its parts, then write out SUVAP for each dimension, figure out what it is you have and what you're missing, and then identify an equation that links what you start with to what you need at the end, and just follow the usual rules of physics. Here I've got a digital diagram, this was before, I had my visualizer, and you can add on the set of usual labels. It's always good to have a vector diagram. Always good to be very clear. We have our sine function that will allow us to find the vertical information. We have the cosine function that allows us to find the horizontal speed. I should say technically these should all be U's and not V's, but never mind. You can also sometimes have a bit of a think about it. Does it make sense that most of our speed is horizontal here? Well, for an angle of 20, yeah, that's fine. That makes sense. Does it make sense that it's 66? Well, sure. It's a bit less than 70. It's not more. You might think that these should add up to 70, but they don't. It's not how vectors work. And that's all fine. Likewise, you can sort of check the directions. If you had minus 24 here, that would suggest you're shooting it down the way, which would be quite strange. So based on our two starting speeds, our horizontal and vertical, we can then solve the rest of the problem. We do our SUVA in both directions and fill in what information we have. Then we take our journey, we split it in half, and we'll work out the time it takes to get to the top, and then double it. Last of all, based on that time that we now have, in the vertical case here, we can work out the total height. Or in the horizontal case, you can work out the range. So that's the height. And here's the range. The second part of your homework are these three questions. This is a more typical question that you would expect to get in, a, in an exam. 
This is a much more challenging question. So in physics, for all the topics, there'll be some questions that are quite straightforward, some that are more A's, and some that are occasionally really, really tricky. And this is one of the really tricky questions in terms of projectile motion. What makes it tricky is the whole thing has been sort of lifted off the ground. We're not launching from the zero position. Also, our journey is not symmetric. We don't have a return to the starting height. We're getting interrupted where the basketball is. Now I can promise you, it's all actually the same stuff. It's just that people tend to get a bit overwhelmed or instead of focusing on learning to understand what's really going on, they learn or memorize a bit of a script and that catches those people out every time. The physics exams are deliberately designed to make sure you actually understand what you're doing. So I strongly recommend that's where you focus your effort when studying. Now to solve this problem you might get a bit confused. Where do I start? Well thankfully they've given you some breadcrumbs. They've told you what to do. So first step is calculate the horizontal and vertical components of the ball. That's exactly the same as normal. We have a starting speed, we have an angle and you use the cosine and sine functions to work out the horizontal speed at the start and the horizontal uh, vertical speed at the start as well. And you get these numbers. Fine. For the next bit, we're told to show that the time taken for the ball to reach the basket is 0 0.69 seconds. And you might say, well, how am I going to know that? Well, you're given a whole bunch of information, but the bit that's quite crucial is this X range. You're told the basket is 2.9 meters away from the player. That's critical because if you know how far you've got to travel horizontally, and you also know the speed you're going horizontally, you can combine these two together using displacement equals speed times time to work out the time you have for that. For a show that question, you have to be super clear with your working. Make sure you show every step. Once you've got that, you can then tackle the much more challenging question, part C. Calculate the height of the top of the basket. Well, you can't really do that in one step. What you have to recognize is that we're going to just focus on this sort of projectile part. We're going to pretend this is our new ground level. We're going to ignore the fact it's all floating up in the air. And what we're going to try and work out is that for our time of 0 0.69 seconds, when we start off moving at this speed up the way and we're in a gravity field which produces an acceleration of minus 9.8, how much higher are we going to be at the end compared to the start? Now the nice thing about this is the equation doesn't care if you're talking about something that's very high or something that's actually a bit lower or something that's actually the same height. No matter what the reality is, the equation will give you a number to describe what's going on. The diagram tells you though this value should be a positive value, you should be slightly higher than where the basketball player threw it from. That's quite nice. We identify the equation we're going to use. We're after a displacement. We're going to label it capital H. Why not? I encourage you strongly to draw your own diagrams. And I also encourage you to add your own labels. It's a very powerful tool. makes life a lot easier for everyone. And long story short, we put in some numbers and we end up with a value of 1.11. This means our basket is 1.11 meters above the basketball player. Now, if you'd skipped out your diagram and forgotten what the question said exactly, quite often people would stop here. That's why diagrams are key. They help you by forcing you to think about things and they give you a reference point. What we're after is this bigger height, the height of the whole thing. And it's quite easy to see that if we have this bit and we know the starting height the player was at at the beginning, was 2.3, all we've got to do is add that on to the extra bit we've just thrown it and that tells us the final height should be 3.4 meters. I would then encourage you to have a bit of a think about the answer. Does it make sense? Could a basketball net be at 3.4 meters? Well, yeah, probably. Tall people are about 2 meters tall. They have 1 meter long arms. You know, they can possibly reach it, but it's not too easy. That sort of makes sense to me. There is a final part to this question. One that involves a bit of thinking and a written response. A student who is watching says the player should throw the ball with a higher speed 
at the same angle. The ball would then land in the basket as before, but it would take a shorter time to travel to 2.9 meters. You are asked to explain, that means tell me why, the statement is incorrect. Well, bits of it might be fine and bits of it might be wrong, so you have to really think about it. Is it true that throwing the ball faster would result in it traveling the 2.9 meters in less time? Well, throwing the whole thing faster at this direction would mean that you have a bigger horizontal speed and a bigger vertical speed. So if the horizontal speed goes up, the ball will travel over there faster and cover the same distance in less time. So that bit's true. It will take a shorter time to travel 2.9 meters. The bit that's wrong though is that it's not going to land in the basket. You see here this is a two-dimensional piece of motion. There's a sideways bit and there's a vertical bit and the skill of a basketball player is to get the two of them to work together so that the ball arrives at this sideways distance and this vertical distance at the same point. When you just take the angle and throw harder, well what it does is it means you get more vertical motion. So it will travel over there in less time, but it'll be probably up here somewhere at that point. That's no good. You're both higher, well, you get higher for the whole thing. If you were to ask what is the correct solution, well, it's actually quite tricky. If you choose a big angle, well, you can take all the time in the world, really, but that's not so good. If you choose a shallower angle, then you can throw it faster and you can get there and maybe it works out. But the reason players don't tend to do that is because if you're even a tiny bit off, it makes a huge difference where you land. These final questions for homework are intended to be a bit of a challenge for those of you who are feeling quite confident about the earlier parts. If you found the earlier parts really difficult and spent lots of time on those, feel free to skip out this section. If you'd like a proper sort of lesson on just this topic, I recommend the video links just here. This comes from Mythbusters. They do a really nice job. They take a gun in a handgun and they shoot it and they also drop one at the same time. It turns out that's incredibly hard to deal with because it goes so fast and it's quite dangerous. So it's about five parts in total, but the start and the finish are linked here. This video clip here shows a teacher offering tutorials on this problem for their classes. So you can talk about someone driving off a cliff or throwing a ball up in the air, whatever you like. This simulation goes to FET Colorado and it involves a whole bunch of simulations for physics and other sciences that you can try out with your Chromebook. I'm going to set you a task with that, but more on that later. The idea is you can have a big cannon, take it up to higher heights or lower heights, you can adjust the firing angle, you can adjust the firing speed, and you can even do things like turn on the effects of air resistance or have larger or smaller cannonballs. But those effects are quite minor. Um, there's also a famous um, kind of thought experiment that's quite a classic. It's called the monkey and hunter problem. It's a bit strange and you know maybe not so relevant these days when we don't tend to hunt monkeys. But the problem goes like this. There's a hunter with a simple blow dart or a gun that essentially doesn't have any sights and they're planning for whatever reason to shoot at a monkey they see hanging over in a tree. The monkey though is a clever monkey and he's decided he doesn't want to be shot that day so he's paying attention. When he sees the explosive um, smoke coming out of the gun the monkey lets go and his plan is to avoid being shot by the gun because the monkey thinks the gun will fire straight away and he will fall underneath the path of the bullet. The irony is that the monkey still sadly gets shot because if the gun is pointing directly at where the monkey was, well, the gun bullet will not follow that straight line. It will in fact curve like any other projectile because it will fall a certain distance as it travels forwards. Because the monkeys made the mistake and dropped when the gun was shot, sadly, the amount the monkey is going to drop will be exactly the same as the amount the bullet drops from the straight line path. And that's what means the monkey gets shot. 
There's a rather elaborate version made here with a very large sort of compressed air can that shoots a tennis ball. And there's this um, video link that's one of my own that I shot recently, which involves a classroom demonstration. It works quite nicely, actually. You basically just literally look along the barrel, aim at where the target's meant to be, and ensure they fall at the same time. Um, to trigger the monkey letting go, well, we have an electromagnet, and the idea is when a light gate sees the ball coming out the end of the barrel, it cuts off the electricity, the electromagnet lets go of the target, and it starts falling as well. Um, for those of you who have some knowledge of um, how guns work, you might recognize that actually you can point a gun at things and hit it reasonably reliably. How do we solve that problem? Well, it turns out um, the manufacturer of guns know about this, and built into the sights themselves is a way to compensate. If you have iron sights, the range you set the sights for tells you when, you know, how much you want to compensate. There's a similar system for windage coming from the side. If you have a telescopic sight, there's actually a whole set of um, small markings along the crosshair to allow a sniper to adjust for it as they're going along. This slide describes probably one of my favorite demonstrations in physics. To allow you to see the actual path of the projectiles, what we use is a stream of water. You take a tap and you have some water come in and it goes through a little nozzle that's pointing slightly upwards. And you end up from that with a stream of water flowing down into your sink. By adjusting the pressure, you can get more of it and by adjusting the angle, you can affect that as well. So basically you can create any starting vector you like, any speed, any angle. Obviously you're restricted somewhat into making sure the water goes into the sink. The second thing you do is instead of just letting the water spray out in a line, is you have a little vibrator or an oscillator here that shakes the whole system side to side. And what that does is it changes your consistent stream into a whole range of little individual drops. If you look at it live, you see the drops continue to follow the consistent stream though. You don't get what, what is shown in this photograph. Um, but of course, if you took a photograph of the stream of particles, they get frozen in time. But the reason this one's so impressive to watch is if this was a video, well, you'd still see the droplets frozen in time. The clever bit is you have a strobe light and the strobe light flashes on and off at a certain frequency. And the trick is you set that frequency to be exactly the same as the oscillator that is creating the drops. That means when the flash is on, you see these drops, it goes dark for a moment, and this drop will move to the next position. The light turns back on, and you see it there. It goes off, moves along, it turns back on. What you create is the illusion that these water droplets are hanging in the air. And that's quite impressive to see if you can do it live. This is incredibly time consuming to set up and calibrate though, so we usually don't bother taking it out. Um, highlighting here, overlaying on top, shows you some of the effects. You see here I've circled all the droplets and you can see it's following the curve as you normally expect. In the case on the left, I've also highlighted an interesting point. You see we said before that in the vertical direction, you'd have an acceleration down the wing. That means that for a certain time, that's the time for one flash, the droplets are going to move down. But as time goes on, they're going to get faster and faster and faster. And then they move down faster and faster, so they cover more distance. These red lines are getting more spaced out. But in the horizontal direction, the green lines here, you can see that the spacing remains, at least approximately, the same throughout the entire journey. The droplets are not speeding up in the horizontal direction, only the vertical direction. These, this confirms the two basic starting assumptions we had, which is basically you can ignore friction. This video here shows what's called Newton's thought experiment. This was how he visualized the idea of linking projectiles to orbital mechanics. 
He said that if you were to shoot a cannonball around the sur or along the surface of the Earth, well, you might see a path that goes along and then it eventually falls. But if you can get a big enough cannon that's on a high enough mountain and you shoot it fast enough, well, maybe you can shoot it far enough that it actually lands slightly behind where you'd expect. And if you shoot it even faster, well, it could actually curve quite far behind the Earth, even to a point where you can't see. If you go further with this and eventually have an absolutely crazy sized cannon with a crazy sized speed on top of a crazy big mountain that can't possibly exist, but if you assume you could, well, when you shoot that cannonball, it might be going so fast that, well, it just leaves Earth altogether. And then in between these two extreme cases where you land or you shoot away, there's this balance. If your speed and height is matched, basically, well, then by the time you start curving, you've missed the Earth. And if your curve of your fall matches the curve of the Earth, well, you just go around and around forever. This is an orbit. Now, we're not very familiar with these things because the speed required to get an orbit is very, very big. And the height required to be away from Earth's atmosphere is also very, very big. It's about 100 miles or so. So it isn't something that was available for Newton to actually do in his time. But with his imagination, his thought experiment, he was able to describe the idea. And then he pointed out the moon. He said, well, what if the moon is doing the same thing? In fact, what if all things that orbit are doing this effect? What if there's this balance? Now, it turns out that for every orbit, there's a certain speed you need to stay in that orbit. If you go too fast, well, you'll climb out higher. If you go too slow, you'll fall towards the Earth. There's a natural sort of balance. One of my favorite games is called Simple Rocket Orbit, and you can maybe have a look on it. It's, it's not free. It's a bit like the Kerbal Space Program, and it involves a series of physics-based problems that you just trial and error your way through. You can build and design rockets and control when you fire your fuel, and it really provided me with a sense of how rocket science works. Needless to say, the actual engineers have